It's a pleasure for me uh, to be here, and um, I want to begin by saying thanks to the Dharma Civilization Foundation, uh, directed or uh, organized by Manohar Shinde and uh, Shiva Bajpai, for allowing me to be the Vivekananda visiting scholar uh, in uh, Dharma studies at the University of California, Irvine, this current year. Uh, let me give a, a brief Advertisement, uh, we're sponsoring a program called Focus on India at UCI, and we've already had the first in the sequence. We're doing one major program each quarter. Uh, the first quarter, this past uh, November, earlier in November, uh, Pratapaditya Pal was our guest lecturer in Indian art history, uh, speaking about uh, adoring the goddess in the autumn in India. Then in February, February 7th, Staneshwar Timalsina, who's going to be here, will also be at UCI giving a lecture on the Tantra. And perhaps of greatest interest to all of you here is in the spring, in April 16th, Tuesday, we're doing a Sarod concert in the distinguished Barclay Irvine Theater at uh, Irvine. And having Alam Khan, the son of Ali Akbar Khan, uh, give a Sarod concert plus uh, Rabindra Sangeet by Maitri um, Chakraborty. It'll be a splendid evening, and I cordially invite all of you to uh, watch for the announcements regarding that. Uh, tickets for adults will be $15 each, uh, students will be uh, $5. It'll be a splendid occasion, and I cordially invite you to be aware of that and to join us on that, uh, on that occasion. Let me, though, begin. I'm going to be talking about Hindu studies in the United States, opportunities and challenges. But let me begin with a joke, uh, just to kind of loosen things up a little bit and to uh, help us all relax. The story is told about a young paratrooper who is about to give his first jump. And naturally, the young paratrooper was terrified. Uh, he didn't quite know. He had heard from his colleagues that the first jump was really kind of a tough thing to do. And he was speaking to his commanding officer and saying, Sir, I, I'm not sure I'll be able to do this. The commanding officer said, Look, this, it's all high technology now. The chutes are almost totally automatic. When you leave the plane, uh, the chute kind of opens automatically. Uh, if it doesn't, you just pull the cord, uh, and then it'll open for sure. And if it doesn't, well, he said, then you just say, Oh, Lord Buddha, save me. And the youngster didn't think much about that, but he remembered the advice of his commanding officer. And so here came the time then for the first jump. And he was terrified, as I had said before. And the time came, and the commanding officer kind of pushed him out of the plane. And he's falling through the air. And as he falls, the chute doesn't open. So he reaches down, and he pulls the cord. Nothing happens. And he pulls it a second time. Nothing happens. Pulls it a third time. Nothing happens. And finally he remembers what his commanding officer had told him. He said, Oh Lord Buddha, save me. At which point a huge hand came out of the heavens and came under him and let him sit on his hand and was leading him down to the earth. And the kid sitting on the hand, he said, Jesus Christ. Christ, at which point, <laughs> that's, my, that's my favorite comparative religion joke, and I, I do history of religions or comparative religions, and I thought you might uh, appreciate that story. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, the, the problem I'm going to be addressing is, what is the relation between the academic community, the university, secular academic community. What's the relation between that on the one hand and believing communities on the other? I presume many of you are Hindus, believing Hindus. Well, what's the relationship between what you do as a believer in the Hindu tradition, the relation between that and what goes on in a place like the University of California at Irvine or any other secular university all across the U.S.? I was asked specifically uh, to speak to that whole issue of what, what is the relation between the, 
the secular intellectual community and the believing community. And I want to do that by sort of backing into that topic. And I'm going to do it in the following way. I'm going to go way back to the Middle Ages. And I'm going to talk about an old story that was first told by Heinrich Zimmer, a well-known art historian, who got the story from the great Martin Buber, who wrote this massive book, I don't know if you are familiar with medieval studies, called The Tales of the Hasidim. Martin Buber collected old Jewish tales from the Middle Ages. And Heinrich Zimmer found this wonderful story about Rabbi Isaac, son of Jekyll. Rabbi Isaac lived in the city of Krakow, Krakow in Poland. He lived in a little house in the center of the ghetto in Krakow. And he had a dream, not once, not twice, but three times, a recurring dream. And in the dream, he was told to take a journey, to go on a journey from Krakow in Poland, all the way to Prague, which in those days was in a place called Bohemia, not Slovakia in modern terms. Well, Rabbi Isaac was an old man, and he was hesitant to make long and difficult journeys. Actually, it's a journey of only a few hundred miles in terms of the modern world. But in medieval times, to go two or three hundred miles was a major undertaking. But he decided that he would follow his dream. And so he traveled with great difficulty all the way from Krakow over to Prague. And he was told to go to the palace of the kings and to look for the bridge leading over the river to the palace of the kings. And if he would dig under the bridge, he would find a great treasure. Well, Rabbi Isaac made the journey. He arrived at the river going by the palace of the kings. He found the bridge leading over the river that he supposedly, under which he would find a treasure. The only problem was the bridge was guarded day and night by a platoon of guards. So Rabbi Isaac sat down a little ways from the river, uh, from the bridge on the embankment of the river, and waited one day, two days, three days. The guards were always there. Finally, the captain of the guard came over and he said, hey, old man, why are you sitting here? Rabbi Isaac said, well, I was told to come here in a dream. <laughs> you were told to come here in a dream? Said the captain of the guard. Why, I've been having a dream. I had a dream that I should go from here in Prague all the way to a place in Poland, a place called Krakow. <laughs> and I was told if I went into the city and found the ghetto and found the house of an old rabbi whose name was Rabbi Isaac, son of Jekyll. If I would look in his front room and look under his stove, I would find a great treasure. But he said, you can't be kidding. No one would follow their dream, such a dream. It's idiotic. Rabbi Isaac said, thank you very much. He returned from Prague, back to his home city, went into the ghetto, went into his little house, he dug under the little wood-burning stove in the front room, and lo and behold, he found a huge pot of gold. Heinrich Zimmer, having told that story, then comments as follows. Now, the real treasure to end our misery and trials is never far away. It is not to be sought in any distant region. It lies buried in the innermost recess of our own home, that is to say, our own being. And it lies behind the stove, the life and warmth-giving center of the structure of our existence, our heart of hearts, if we could only dig. But there is an odd and persistent fact 
that it is only after a faithful journey to a distant region, a foreign country, a strange land, that the meaning of the inner voice that is to guide our quest can be revealed to us. And together with this odd and persistent fact, there goes another, namely, that the one who reveals to us the meaning of our cryptic inner message must be a stranger of another creed and of a foreign origin. So where is the truth? Truth is always within us. But there's that strange twist that Rabbi Isaac discovered, and Martin Buber discovered, and Heinrich Zibber discovered, that that inner truth sometimes only comes out when you're willing to take a journey and go a ways, to follow a dream, and then have that revealed to you that that which was always there to begin with, but you had never seen it before. Studying the Hindu tradition, it seems to me, is one remarkable way of following the dream for an American student. To take a journey into Hindu studies is one way to become acquainted, of course, with the Hindu tradition, but then to become acquainted with themselves. But let's go to India. And let's go to the month of May, May 14th, 1926, there was a Swami whose name was Hari Parananda Aranya. I don't know if you've heard that name. He was born in 1869. He had spent many, many years in his early life in the Marabar Hills in Bihar, in caves in Bihar. Then he went off to Rishikesh, to Hardwar to the caves in the high Himalaya mountains. And then in May of 1926, May 14th, 1926, he entered a, a built-up cave, a sort of artificial cave, in a place called Madhupur in Bihar. His followers had built a, a meditation center, really is what it was, not technically a, a natural cave, but a cave-like meditation place. He entered that cave on May 14, 1926. He remained in that cave until April 19, 1947, the day he died. Just under 21 years. Ram Shankar Bhattacharya, the pundit with whom I worked for many years in India. I did my postdoc at Banaras Hindu University and first met Ram Shankar Bhattacharya way back in 1968, 67 actually it was. We worked together for a time and then collaborated over the years. In fact, we published several books together. He died just a few years back. But anyway, he was a follower. His father was a follower of Swami Hari Harananda Aranya. And he said his father used to take him to see the Swami. And the way, the way the meditation room was set up, there was a window. You could look into the meditation area and you could see the Swami in Padmasana, the full lotus posture. And he said as you would look in, it, his body would be a deathly pale up to the neck. And from the neck up, his face was a bright beet red from doing pranayama and pursuing the yogic way, the way of jnana yoga, the way of the yoga of knowledge. I often tell that story to my students on the first day of class because I then ask them, can you imagine being in a cave for 21 years? Actually, he would come out on Saraswati Day uh, and give darshan over the years, but basically he remained in the cave for just under 21 years. Why would anybody do that? Why would anyone turn totally away from the world and go inside himself to the point where he gave the rest of his life to that? He remained in the cave until the day he died. Seeking moksha, seeking self-understanding, a journey, a different kind of journey. You know, Rabbi Isaac 
we understand that in a way. You follow a dream, you go from Krakow, and you go all the way to Prague, uh, and you, then you discover something about yourself. Interestingly, Swami Hari Harananda Aranya makes a different kind of journey. He makes a Hindu journey, or a journey well known to the Hindu tradition of going deeply into oneself, turning totally away from the world in the hope of attaining a kind of enlightenment, a salvation, what do you want to call it, moksha? There are all sorts of technical terms we can use to talk about that sort of quest, that internal journey. In search of the Atman, or the Purusha, pure consciousness, that's apart from the everyday world that we all live in. But let me add another journey. Again, someone who was born in the same year, 1869, whose career paralleled that of Swami Hari Harananda Aranya, you know, Swami Hari Harananda enters his cave in 1926. The second person I'm talking about begins his, his political work in the 1920s. Primarily, he became head of the nationalist movement in 1915. And in the 20s, and the 30s, and the 40s, as Swami Hari Harananda Aranya was pursuing meditation in his cave to discover his true self, this fellow was doing another kind of journey, namely the journey towards the freedom an independent India. And of course, I'm talking about Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Now, interestingly, Gandhi was also a yogin. He was known usually as a karma yogin, a yogin, a yogin of action. He was also, to some degree, a bhakti yogin. We know every morning that he led a sort of devotional session devotional session given over to singing devotional songs, Vaishnava songs, Shaivite songs, even Muslim, even, even Sufi songs. Now it's interesting, I then tell my students, well what, what's the difference between the journey that Swami Hari Harananda Aranya makes in the cave deeply in himself, what's the difference between that on the one hand and the journey of Mahatma Gandhi political journey, a karma journey, a bhakti journey, yet they're both yogins, they're, they're Hindus, well no, well of course Swami Hari Harananda Aranya, the last thing he ever wanted was to be known. Interestingly by the way, kind of footnote, uh, I discovered when I first learned about Swami Hari Harananda Aranya, uh, I discovered that his successor, Dharma Mega Aranya, was in the cave, the little meditation hall in Madhupur in Bihar. And so I wrote him. I said, uh, Dear Swamiji, I'm a professor, a young assistant professor. I'm here on a postdoc in India, uh, and I've written a book on classical Sankhya and yoga. And this particular ashram in Madhupur is, is the only Sankhya yoga ashram still in contemporary India. And I said, I would love to come and spend some time with you. He writes back to me and he said the following, Oh, Professor Larson, I know of your work. He, he read and uh, spoke English fluently. In those days, the Swamis were usually, Hari Harananda Aranya also was fluent in various languages. And he said, please don't come. Continue to do your work. Continue to publish. Let me continue on my journey in my meditation hall. And I wish you well in your career. That was, must have been oh, over 40, half, almost half a century ago. And I never went. Elong has died, and now has been succeeded by Bhaskaraya, uh, Swami Bhaskara, who's in Madhupur. And I haven't gone to see him. I've sent my students, I, I let my students go. But I, I, you know, the, the tradition of authentic yoga, if you find an authentic yoga, they don't want to see you. They, they, they really don't want to. You know, these, well, I, don't want to, I should be careful what I say. You watch out for these crackpot yogis who want to be famous and you know, be on TV and all this kind of thing. That always makes me suspicious because the authentic tradition is not that. The authentic tradition is, this is if you're going to do that quest, do it. And you will then find your mentor, you'll find your swami, you'll find your meditation leader. Uh, in any case, your life will be enriched in the proper way then, instead of seeking kind of fame. 
So let me come back now. I've been teaching Hindu studies. Uh, I, I teach a lot of India, Indian philosophy. I teach Buddhist studies. I teach Buddhist philosophy. I suppose my major interest, as a matter of fact, is the philosoph philosophical traditions of India. Uh, and I've been committed through the years to bringing knowledge of India, awareness of India, and Indian spirituality. Not that I'm a Hindu. I'm not a Hindu. I'm not exactly sure what I am anymore. I'm, I'm, I think I'm more of a Hindu and more of a Buddhist than I am a Christian, to tell you the truth. But I'm a, I'm a kind of mix. I suspect probably that's true for many of you as well. And that's okay to be a mix, because I think the Hindu tradition sort of allows that kind of plural mixture of things, as long as you don't become a complete idiot mixing, mixing uh, traditions. But in any case, I have been concerned about how I, as an academic, you know, at the University of California at Santa Barbara for 25 years, I was at Indiana University as Director of India Studies to or Chair for eight years. Uh, now I'm teaching at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, one of the big problems, those of us who teach religious studies, and who teach Hindu studies, and Buddhist studies, and Jain studies, and Sikh studies, is what is the relation between what we do as academics, as intellectuals, in a secular university environment, what's the relation between that and the believing community? And I don't know if you've kept up with what's going on in terms of some of the history of late, the last decade, maybe the last 20 years of Hindu studies in the United States and the American Academy and the, the, the academic world. It's been quite controversial on many levels. I want to talk about that. And I hope in conversation we can then have some give and take <coughs> about that. So what, what I'm saying is, what, what exactly is the relation between somebody like me studying all this stuff in an academic environment, largely a secular, especially the University of California, a lot, totally secular environment, and the believing community, the, the, the Hindu community? And I'm going to suggest there are various relations, various ways of thinking about the relation that are operative, that are happening right now in American higher education. And I want to talk about several of those. First, there are those who argue that there's no relation whatever between Hindu studies in the academic university, in the secular university, and the believing Hindu community. That the two, that the, 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 the two are totally separate. And I think the best example of that is one of my dear friends, and you, you may be surprised when I tell you this, my dear friend Wendy Doniger, who teaches at the University of Chicago. I've known Wendy for over 40 years. We're good friends. What's interesting is Wendy couldn't care less about Hindu religion or the Hindu believing community. She's not interested in theory. She's not interested in the history of religions generally. Actually, she's a trained Sanskritist. And she loves narrative stories. And she's quite interested in sexuality. And so if you read any of her books, you'll see again and again and again, she, she's telling stories constantly, and especially stories as they relate to sexual episodes. And interestingly, Naturally, therefore, she's looked at the Puranas, she's looked at the Mahabharata, she's looked at all that later medieval Indian literature filled with these stories. Now, interestingly, she was shocked when she heard that there were, the believing community had some serious questions about the way she was treating the material. Because it never occurred to her that the believing community would be impacted by her scholarly work. So if, if you speak to her, and in fact she and I have chatted many, many times, she, she sees no relation whatever between the believing community and the academic community. The academic quest, if you're interested in, in Indian literature, if you're interested in stories, if you're interested in sexuality, uh, then read her stuff. If you're interested in how her research relates to the believing community, you'll never find it. It's just not there. Well, that's an interesting point. Now, the same thing can be said by the other character, which I'm sure you've all heard about, and that is Salman Rushdie. He, too, when he wrote Satanic Verses, never dawned on him that there was a relation between what he was writing about in the Islamic community and the Muslim-believing community. 
And he was sort of shocked when the fatwa finally came down by the Ayatollah Khomeini calling for his death and calling for his execution. And he went through a traumatic experience over a, a period of years because of that. So like Wendy, he just thought what he was doing in Midnight's Children or what he was doing in Satanic Verses was simply sort of writing a novel. He was, he was, he was being an artist. And Muslims should have realized, he said, and he says this in his new, his new memoir, uh, Joseph Anton, if you've looked at that memoir of his. He says, Pe people should just realize that uh, the artist can write a novel and the novel has nothing whatever to do with believing communities. Well, I think both Wendy and Salman Rushdie have learned some tough lessons because I think there is, in fact, a relation between the academic community or the artist community and the believing community, and one has to pay attention to that. It doesn't mean that they can't be critically related to one another. Of course, they can be. But to claim that there's no relation whatever is utterly ridiculous. The second kind of relation, there are those, and in fact, if you look around the country, at departments of religious studies in the United States. Probably what I'm saying now is what is the case largely. That is to say, what I would call an asymmetrical relationship. That is to say, there are those who are doing Hindu studies in the academy who are fully aware of the believing community. And the believing community is fully aware of the academic intellectual community but each one is using the other only for self-directed reasons. I call it the seminary relation. That is, uh, Christian seminaries will often pursue the academic study of religion in order to, to, to build up their own understanding of Christian theology and Christian history. In other words, I study, I study religions for the purpose of understanding myself, my own tradition primarily. Or, you find many scholars in the academic community who kind of use the believing community for data, but aren't really that interested in the believing community. They recognize that it's there, but their, their task is to build an academic study program in a particular secular university. Now that's very different from Wendy's approach. Wendy's saying there's no connection. What I'm talking about now in terms of the relation is, I think they're self-directed. The, the, self-directed relation. That is, I study other religions in order to understand my own religion. Or I study, I'm involved in the academic study of religion and I pay attention to believing communities, but I don't take them very seriously. So it's asymmetrical, which, which is very different from what Wendy does. A third relationship is what I would call a, relation, a relationship of other directedness. That is to say, a relationship of uh, what I would call uh, reciprocity, and this is the one, of course, where I come, where I come in. This is this is would be my understanding. That is to say, the, the university community, insofar as it wishes to study religion, must pay attention to the believing community, because the believing community makes it possible for the academic community to exist, and vice versa. The believing community must pay attention to the critical study of religion. If you think you can pursue your own believing community without being critically alive to what's being said about the study of religion generally, you're going to regress in terms of your understanding of your own tradition. So I'm saying that the relation, which is a fully equal relation of reciprocity, of, of pure symmetry between the academic community on the one hand and the believing community on the other. Uh, and let me quote uh, the famous Breda Christensen, the Norwegian historian of religion. Uh, and in fact, I am heavily influenced in my own work by what he has said. He says, quote, let us never forget that there exists no other religious reality than the faith of the believer. If we really want to understand religion, we must refer exclusively to the believer's testimony. If our opinion of another religion differs from the opinion and evaluation of the believers, then we are no longer talking about their religion. We have turned aside from historical reality and are concerned only with ourselves. That's important. In other words, 
Whatever I do in my academic study is profoundly related to what's going on in the believing community. And there must be a continuing critical dialogue. In other words, I don't uncritically accept what the believing community tells me. In fact, I may be critical of the believing community. By the same token, the believing community has to listen clearly to what academics are saying and to engage in continuous exchange, to have an equal footing. It seems to me that's the only healthy way to relate the study of religion to the believing community. Now then, the fourth relation, the fourth kind of relation, you know, taking self-directed, other-directed, no relation whatever. The fourth one is what we're witnessing now in American higher education and American culture generally. And that is the relation of hostile defense. Religion? Hindus, uh, hostile defense. Uh, or or def defensive hostility. Many Hindus have felt in the believing community that they have been insulted by the academic community. And I'm thinking here, not so much of Wendy uh, and Doniger's work, uh, because Wendy, you know, as, as an old friend of mine, she never intended anything like that in her work because she just wasn't interested in such things. But I think there are some students, uh, for example, Courtright's work in Ganesha, Lane's work on Shivaji, Kripal's work on the Ramakrishna mission, that have deeply insulted Hindus. And Hindus have then reacted very negatively. And may I say, rightly so, rightly so. And I think the academics who, are, who engage in that kind of unfair critique or insensitive critique need to be brought up short. And they need to be told, no, to, to, to sully our community is not really, you, you wouldn't do that, you don't do that to the Christians, you don't do that to the Jews, you don't do that to the Muslims, so don't do it to the Hindus either. Uh, I think that's a healthy reaction, except only as a point of departure. That is to say, you, you begin with criticism, you say, hey, you know, stop faulting my tradition. The, whatever, whatever a person's religious belief is, is profoundly important about that person, and it's one of the things that a person truly treasures in his or her life. And the last thing you do is insult anybody's religious faith. You just don't do that. And so if we get into this, what's been going on in our field sometimes, and again, you know, I know Paul Cartwright. I know uh, Jeffrey Kripal. Uh, I, I've talked, uh, we've had dinner together. I mean, I, these are colleagues of mine in the academy. Uh, and I've simply said to them, you, you need to become more sensitive. You, you need to develop this kind of reciprocity that I was talking about. When we're both on equal footing and trying to understand one another critically. Nothing wrong with that. But don't insult the believer. To insult the believer is to do a, a, a dreadful, a dreadful act against any given uh, person. And then uh, finally, uh, the, the, the Fifth point, I've got five points here that I've been unfolding here. Uh, it's perhaps the relation itself needs to be called into question. That is to say, I was saying, I'm talking about the relation between, on the one hand, intellectual, academic, secular, scholarship, and then believing communities. And I'm talking about how these two things relate. Maybe the two things themselves are wrongly formulated. That is to say, maybe, maybe finally there aren't just believing communities separate from intellectual communities. Maybe those boundaries have to begin to break down. And one has to move out of that binary, that dichotom dichotomy relationship into a new way of posing the issues. And I think in the field in this country, we're on the verge of that. What's going on, for example, at uh, um, uh, Lincoln, Claremont, Claremont Lincoln, yes, yes. And what's going on with the Hindu seminary program? What's going on with uh, other, uh, uh, Deepak Shimkata's work with uh, the, the Society for South Asian Studies? All of these efforts are beginning to break down the barriers so that now the believing community is becoming increasingly sophisticated in terms of the critical study of religion and the intellectual community is opening, it, it can no longer live in a closed intellectual world where they just talk to each other and nobody else. There has to be ongoing exchange. That's beginning to happen. And I think that's very healthy 
for the future of the study of religion and the future of the believing communities. And let me just say, um, when I was in Indiana and I was putting together our India Studies program, it became very clear to me early along, I was there from 1995 till about 2003, it became very clear to me, we could not develop Hindu studies or India studies in the University, Indiana University or in the state of Indiana without a direct without direct support from the Indian community in Indiana. And interestingly, we developed friends throughout in Indianapolis, in Kokomo, and up in the north, and in all, all those, the, the cities in the state of Indiana. And interestingly, we had BJP followers. We had left-wing uh, atheist Hindus. You know, some Hindus don't believe in God. They don't, they're, they're, they're critical leftist thinkers. Uh, we had connections with the Muslim community. The, what we, we, all comers were welcome in the sense that what we were trying to build was a, a, a program, India Studies, for all varieties of those who are from India and involved in the Indian community. And hence, uh, it was a very healthy, it was a very healthy um, community that developed over those eight years that I was there. And it was interesting. I became quite worried with this kind of hostile defensiveness that was happening throughout the academy nationally because I saw that as poison for the future of India studies. If, if, if we're, if we're going to be just defensive and hostile between the academic community and the believing community, there's no future for either of us. We've got to break down those barriers and kind of open up the field and uh, have a, as I say, a reciprocal interaction between the believing community and the intellectual secular uh, community. And I think maybe I'll stop there. I think I've been going on for uh, a little while here. And it'd be time to have a little chat uh, or to have some questions or answers from all of you.